Hi and welcome to another video and today we're going to look at why the HbA1c reading is not an accurate way of looking at your blood glucose. Now I'm a qualified phlebotomist and also a specialist practitioner in diabetes and obesity and I've seen thousands of blood tests and the HbA1c is just a guide. It's not the best thing to use to look at your blood glucose management. Just going to give you a few reasons why. So the first thing is before you start panicking and thinking, oh, I thought the HbA1c was the most important thing and a really good indicator. The best indicator is taking your blood glucose on a daily basis, actually looking at the blood glucose levels from your glucose meter is about the best thing you can do. So if every single day your blood glucose management is fantastic, then why would you worry about your HbA1c? And this is actually what's made me want to do this video because so many people have their continual glucose monitors or they use their uh, finger stick to see what their blood glucose is. And it's fantastic. But when they get their HbA1c, especially if they're carnivore or keto, it seems to sometimes bump up a little bit. But there's, there's actually reasons for that. So I do put that proviso in that when I say about the A1c being not the best and most accurate way to, to look at your blood glucose, that's uh, assuming that your daily blood glucose management is good and that also maybe your background insulin is actually really good. So when you do get blood tests, try to make sure that they measure your fasting glucose, your fasting insulin, if possible, your C-peptide, which is sort of a proxy mark of how much insulin you're making. And then that should actually be more beneficial than the A1C, which is a calculated measurement. It's not a direct measurement and it makes an assumption on the life of your red blood cells. Now, if those red blood cells are in your system for longer, it's going to knock out the calculation. I just want to talk about a few things so we just understand that we're on the same page. So the red blood cells, on average, are estimated to last between 90 to 120 days. And they get glycated. So the hemoglobin actually is the thing that gets glycated, the A1C because it's the A1C style of uh, hemoglobin that glucose binds to. There is other types, there's A1B, A1A1, A1A2, but those don't bind to glucose. So the A1C is the one that does bind to glucose, and that's the one we're looking at the percentage of the HbA1c, the percentage of it that's glycated. Now, obviously, if you have a lot of incoming carbohydrates, you might get those HbA1c readings to show that the glycation is, is pretty vast, and maybe you need double figures. But also, there could be another way, and that's if the red blood cells last longer than the supposed 90 to 120 days, because they're going to get glycated over a longer period of time even if you're not eating many carbohydrates, because we still make blood glucose. So hear me out on this. Um, this is what I started to see, that people were coming to me and showing me their CGM readings, and they were amazingly good, very low levels. And yet their average, supposed average glycation on their HbA one c was a bit higher than it was maybe six months previously. But that wasn't borne out by what was happening in the readings. And then I looked at a few other things that can give you a false reading. And from that, I've made this supposition, uh, which seems to be getting a lot of support elsewhere now. So if you have a type of anemia, which is called hemolytic, that's where your body will destroy red blood cells a bit sooner than normal. And those people get a very low A1C reading. Now, that's obvious because the red blood cells are not in the system as long as the average assumed 90 to 120 days. So what if your red blood cells stay in circulation for longer? Because it isn't the glycation that destroys or makes the spleen or the system, the body, decide when to destroy those red blood cells and recycle them, break them down into the heme and the globin and actually get some money back on the recycled red blood cells it's not the glycation because i know that for a fact because we have people that don't go into 5.8 but maybe they've got double figures you know 11 12 even worse than that so it's not the glycation that is the marker of when the body goes wow we need to get rid of these red blood cells so maybe when you're eating carnivore or keto your red blood cells kick around for a bit longer because they're getting the nutrients and they're getting everything they need and they're not in need of recycling. So therefore, you would get this slightly higher glycation reading because they are staying in your system for longer. 
There's other ways of getting false readings on the 81C, for instance. If you have issues with iron, for instance, um, you can get a false reading. Normally, it's a bit too high. That possibly makes sense as well when you understand that hemoglobin is the thing that transports not only oxygen, but iron around the body. So that's that's what I wanted to say. I wouldn't worry too much about your A1C going up if all the other markers are fine. That would be a very important thing to look at. So if you are taking your blood glucose and you wake up in the morning and it is around 100 or 70 to 100, that's probably not that bad. And if you're just coming out of a different way of eating and you're now doing this to reduce your blood glucose problems for want of a better word then you might not be at that level yet but as long as the trend is coming down that's that's really good you could look at uh, some other things which might give you a little bit of an insight into how well your background insulin is forming if it's very sensitive or if you're making too much so you'll see this graph here which is just for illustrative purposes but taken from real data points of many patients over time on average what their blood glucose was and as you can see from year to year you will see that the blood glucose management seems to be going okay, but in the background they're requiring or their body is requiring more and more insulin to make that normal reading of blood glucose continue. And there is a tipping point, as you can see, where the insulin production is so vast, it's very difficult for the, for the cells of the pancreas to keep up. And you will see a downturn in the insulin production and an upturn in the blood glucose management or the blood glucose readings. So that makes total sense that when you have your blood test, you need to have your fasting insulin, fasting glucose and C-peptide. So you can see what's going on with the insulin. But an easy way to do it at home is post-meal. So let's say you wake up, you, t you take your blood. Like I say, actually taking the blood glucose reading from your blood is, is pretty much the gold standard. So if in the morning you wake up and let's say it's 100, you might take a reading two hours later just to see where you are before your meal. And then two hours after a meal, let's hope it's under 120. It might be higher than that, but then we can take a reading maybe three hours later. And as long as that trend is going down and your blood glucose is going back to where we want it to go, sort of a close in, within the range of 70 to 100, then we can assume that the insulin's working or you're insulin sensitive. Well, we don't know exactly how much insulin you're making. That's, that's the point I was trying to get across that. Although that looks pretty good, it's still worth knowing your levels of insulin when you get your blood test. And of course, you've got the the fasting blood glucose range as well. So I, I would not overly worry if, if you wake up and it's 110, to be honest, as long as it comes down uh, after, you know, three or four months of carnivore or keto, you should see that those those readings will be good. Don't fret if it goes up a little bit and you are not eating carbohydrates because your liver is producing glucose overnight to keep you alive, either through uh, glycogenolysis or through gluconeogenesis. So that's uh, another thing that we need to be considering. So that that's pretty much it. Obviously, with the HbA1c on blood glucose measurements, we're not measuring fructose at all. So if you're eating fruit still or anything that's containing fructose, we're not seeing what glycation is going on there. Um, it seems to be that the fructose has a 10 times more powerful um, binding quality than glucose when it comes to glycation products. So anyway, hopefully that's made the HGA1C conundrum or paradox or whatever you want to call it a bit more sensible for you to understand. So just to really summarize, if your blood glucose management daily is very good and you then have an HbA1c that doesn't reflect the average that you're seeing by taking your actual readings, then it might just simply be because the H1 uh, HbA1c is not the most accurate measure and it is an estimated it is an estimated calculation and also it could be because your red blood cells are sticking around for a bit longer. Hope that helped. Ah, you made it to the end of the video. Thank you so much. Don't go yet because I've selected a playlist and a video for you to maybe consider and have a look at. If you haven't already subscribed, then please consider doing so. And if you have already, thank you so much. It has really helped the channel. If you can like, comment and share, I'd appreciate that too. But once again, thank you for stopping right to the end of the video. You can go now. Oh, you're still here. Okay. Well, um, what else could I tell you? Um, how about a big thank you for staying right to the end end and realizing that I was messing about. Yeah, I've gone now. Finished.
No, really, I finished. <laughs>